So uh, I was going to start by going back to um, clustering. Um, uh, we're going to talk about clustering again in the next lesson or two in terms of an application of it. Um, but specifically what I wanted to do was show you k-means clustering in TensorFlow. Let this to stay on. Um, there are some things which are easier to do in TensorFlow than PyTorch, mainly because um, TensorFlow kind of has a, a more complete API at, uh, so far. Um, so there are some things that are just you look in TensorFlow and it's like, oh, there's already a method that does that, um, but there isn't one in PyTorch. Um, and so some and some things are just a bit easier, neater in TensorFlow than in PyTorch. Um, and I actually found uh, k-means quite easy to do. But what I want to do is I'm going to try and show you a way to um, write custom TensorFlow code in a kind of a really PyTorchy way, right? In a kind of an interactive way, and we're going to try and avoid all of the, you know, fancy. Um, Sessiony, graphy, scopy business as much as possible. Um, so, to remind you, um, the way we kind of initially came at clustering was to say, hey, what if we were doing um, um, lung cancer detection in CT scans? And these were like 512 by 512 by 200 um, volumetric things, which is too big to really run a whole CNN over uh, conveniently. Um, so one of the thoughts to fix that was to uh, run some kind of heuristic that found all of the things that looked like they could vaguely be um, nodules, and then create a new data set where you basically zoomed into each of those maybe nodules and created a small little you know, 20 by 20 by 20 cube or something, and you could then use a 3D CNN on that or triplanar CNN. Um, <clears throat> and I. This general concept I wanted to remind you about because I feel like it's something which maybe I haven't stressed enough. I've kind of kept on showing you ways of doing this. Think back to the um, lesson seven with the fish. I showed you the bounding boxes and I showed you the heat maps. The, the reason for all of that was basically to show you how to zoom into things and then create new models based on those zoomed in things. Um, so in the fisheries case, you know, you, we could really just use a <coughs> lower res CNN to find the maybe fish and then zoom into those. Um, in the CT scan case, maybe we can't even do that, so maybe we need to use this kind of mean shift clustering approach. Um, I'm not saying we necessarily do, it'll be interesting to see what the winners use, um, but certainly particularly if you don't have lots of time or you have a lot of data, um, heuristics become more and more interesting. Um, now, the reason a heuristic is interesting is you can do something quickly and approximate that could have lots and lots and lots of false positives, and that doesn't really matter, right? Because you know those false positives means just you know extra data that you're feeding to your you know your real model. Um, so you can always tune it as like, okay, how much time have I got to train my real model, and then I can decide how many false positives I can I can handle. So as long as you're kind of Pre-processing model is better than nothing. You're, you know, you can use it to get rid of some of the stuff that, like, is clearly not uh, a nodule. For example, for example, anything that is like in the middle of the lung wall is not a nodule. Anything that is, you know, all white space is not a nodule, um, and so forth. Okay, so we talked about mean shift clustering um, and how the big benefit of it. Is that um, it allows us to uh, build clusters without knowing how many clusters there are at a time. Um, also, it, um, without any special extra work, it allows us to find um, uh, clusters which aren't kind of Gaussian or spherical, if you like, in shape. Um, but can, that's really important for something like a CT scan, where a cluster will often be like a vessel, which is this really skinny long thing. Um, uh, so, k-means, on the other hand, um, is uh, faster. I think it's n squared rather than n cubed time. Um, we have talked, particularly on the forum, about dramatically speeding up mean shift clustering using approximate nearest neighbors, which is something which we started making some progress on today, so hopefully we'll have results from that maybe by next week. Um, but the basic naive algorithm is certainly um, should be a lot faster for k-means. <coughs> 
Um, so there's one good reason to use it. So um, as per usual, you know, we can start with some with some data, um, um, and we're going to try and figure out what where the cluster centers are. So one quick way to avoid um, hassles in um, TensorFlow is to create an interactive session. So an interactive session basically means that you can call dot run on a computation graph which doesn't return something, or dot eval on a computation graph that does return something, um, and you don't have to worry about creating a graph or a session or you know calling having a session with clause or anything like that. Um, it just it just works. So that's basically what happens when you call tf.interactive session. Okay, so by creating an interactive session, we can then um, kind of do things one step at a time. So in this case, the first step in k-means is to um, pick some initial centroids. So you basically start out and say, okay, if we're going to create uh, however many clusters, so in this case n clusters is 6, right? then start out by saying, okay, well where, where, might, you know, where might those 6 clusters be? And for a long time with k-means, people picked them um, randomly. Um, but most practitioners realized that that was a dumb idea soon enough, and a lot of people had various heuristics for picking them. In 2007, finally, a paper was published actually suggesting a heuristic. Um, I tend to use a very simple heuristic, which is um, what I use here in find initial centroids. So to describe this heuristic, I will show you the code. So find initial centroids looks like this. Um, basically, and I'm going to run through it quickly and then I'll run through it slowly. Basically the idea is we first of all pick um, a single uh, data point index, and then we select that single data point. Okay, so we have one randomly selected data point. And then we find what is the distance from that randomly selected data point to every other data point. And then we say, okay, um, what is the um, data point that is the furthest away? From that randomly selected data point, the index of it and the point itself, and then we say, okay, we're going to append that to the initial centroids. So say that I picked at random this point as my random initial point, the furthest point away from that is probably somewhere around here. Okay, so that would be the first centroid we picked. Okay, we're now inside a loop, and we now go back and we repeat the process. So we now replace our random point with the actual first centroid, and we replace, go through the loop once more. So if we had our first centroid here, our second one now might be somewhere over here. Okay, so we now have two centroids. Um, the next time through the loop, therefore, this is slightly more interesting. This all distances, we're now going to have the distance between every one of our um, initial centroids and every um, other data point. Right, so we've got a matrix, in this case it's going to be 2 by the number of data points. So then we say, okay, for every data point, find the closest cluster. Right, so what's its distance to the closest uh, initial centroid? Right, and then tell me which data point is the furthest away from its closest initial centroid. So in other words, which data point is the furthest away from any centroid? So that's the basic, um, that's the basic algorithm. Um, so let's look and see how we actually do that in TensorFlow. So it looks a lot like NumPy, um, except in places you would expect to see NP, um, we see um, TF. And then we see the API is a little different. Um, um, but not too different, right? So to get a random number, we can just use random uniform. Um, we can tell it what type of random number we want. So we want a random int because we're trying to get a random index, so which ra choose a random data point. Um, it's going to be between zero and the amount of data points we have. Um, so um, that gives us some random index, 
uh, we can now go ahead and index into our data. Now you'll notice I've created something called vData. So what is vData? When we, um, set the, when we set up this k-means in the first place, the data was sent in as a numpy array, and then I call tf.variable on it. Now this is the critical thing that kind of lets us make TensorFlow feel more like PyTorch. Once I do this, data is now basically copied to the GPU, and so when I'm calling something using vData, I'm calling this, this GPU object. Right? Now there's one thing problematic uh, to be aware of, which is that the copying does not actually occur when you write this. The copying occurs when you write this. Okay, so anytime you call tf.variable, if you then try to um, run something using that variable, you'll get back a, an uninitialized variable error unless you call this in the meantime. Okay, so this is this kind of like uh, performance stuff in TensorFlow where they try, try to say, okay, well you can like set up lots of variables at once and then call this initializer and we'll do it all at once for you. Okay, so earlier on we created this k-means um, object. Um, we know that in Python when you create an object it calls underscore underscore init underscore underscore. That's just how Python works. Inside that we copied the data uh, to the GPU by using tf.variable, and then inside find initial centroids we can now access that in order to basically do calculations involving data on the GPU. Um, in TensorFlow, pretty much everything takes and returns a tensor, right? So when you create, when you call random uniform, it's giving us a tensor, you know, an array of random numbers. In this case, we just wanted one of them, so we have to use tf.squeeze to take that tensor and turn it into a scalar, because then we're just indexing into here to get a single item back. Um, so now that we've got that single item back. Um, we then expand it back again into a tensor, because inside our loop, remember, um, this is going to be a list of initial centroids. Right? It's just that this list happens to be uh, of length 1 at the moment. So one of these tricks in, um, in making uh, TensorFlow feel more like PyTorch is to use standard Python loops. Right? So in a lot of TensorFlow code where it's kind of um, you know, more serious performance intensive stuff, you'll see people use like TensorFlow specific loops like tf.while or tf.scan or map or so forth. Um, the challenge with using those kind of loops is it's basically creating a computation graph of that loop. You can't step through it, you can't you know, use it in the normal Pythonic kind of ways. So we can just use normal loops, normal Python loops, if we're careful about how we do it. Okay, so inside our normal Python loop, we can use normal Python functions. Um, so here is a function I created which um, calculates the distance between everything in this tensor compared to everything in this tensor. Right? So all distances um, is, looks very familiar because it looks a lot like the PyTorch code we had. Right? So we, um, for the first array, for the first tensor, we add an additional um, um, access to access 0. And for the second, we add an additional access to access one. So the reason this works is because of broadcasting. So um, a, when it starts out, is a vector. Now, and b is a vector. Now, is is a a column or is a a row? What's the orientation of it? Well, the answer is it's both, and it's neither. Right? It, it's one-dimensional, so it has no concept of what direction it's looking. Right? So, at this, so then what we do is we said um, expand dims on axis 0, so that's rows, right? So that basically says to A, okay, you are now definitely a row vector. Right? You now have one row and however many columns, same as before. And then whereas with B, we add an axis at the end. Right? So B is now definitely a column vector, right? because it now has one column. 
and however many rows we had before. Okay? So with broadcasting, what happens is that this one gets broadcast to this length, and this one gets broadcast to this length. So we end up with a matrix containing the difference between every one of these items and every one of these items. So that's like this kind of simple but powerful concept of how we can do you know, very fast GPU accelerated loops and less code than it would have taken to actually write the loop. And we don't have to worry about out-of-bounds conditions or anything like that, it's all done for us. So that's the trick here, right? And once we've got that matrix, because in TensorFlow everything is a tensor, um, we can call squared difference um, uh, rather than just regular difference, and it gives us the squares of those differences, and then we can sum over the last axis. So the last axis is just the dimensions, right? So we're just creating a Euclidean uh, uh, distance here. Um, and so that's, that's all this code does, right? So this gives us uh, every distance between every element of A and every element of B. Okay, so that's how we get to this point. So then, um, let's say we've gone through a couple of loops, right? So at the, after a couple of loops, R is going to contain a few initial centroids, right? So we now want to basically find out for um, every point, um, how far away is it from its nearest initial centroid? So when we go reduce min with axis equals zero, then we know that that's going over the axis here, because that's what we put into our all distances function. Right? So it's going to go through, um, well actually it's reducing across that, uh, into that axis, so it's actually reducing across our centroids. Um, so at the end of this it says, all right, um, this is for every um, part, piece of our data how far it is away from its nearest centroid. Okay, and that returns the actual distance, right? Because we said do the actual min. So then there's a difference between min and arg, the arg version. So arg max then says, okay, now go through all of the points. Uh, we now know how far away they are from their um, closest centroid, and tell me the index of the one which is furthest away. Right? So arg max is a super handy function. We used it quite a bit in part one of the course. Um, um, but it's well worth making sure we understand how it works. Um, I think in TensorFlow they're, I think they're getting rid of these reduce underscore prefixes. I'm not sure. I think I read that somewhere. Um, so in some version you may find this is called min rather than reduce min. Um, I certainly hope they are. Um, for those of you who don't have such a computer science background, re a reduction basically means taking something in a higher dimension and squishing it down into something that's a lower dimension. For example, summing a vector and turning it into a, into a scalar is called a reduction. So this is a very TensorFlow API, assuming that everybody's a computer scientist and that you wouldn't look for min, you would look for reduce underscore min. So, um, so that's how we got that index. Um, and so um, generally speaking, you know, you have to be a bit careful of uh, data types. Um, I generally don't really notice about data type problems until I get the error, but like if you get an error that kind of says, oh, you passed an int 64 into something that expected an int 32, you can always just cast things like this, right? So we need to index something with an int 32, so we just have to cast it. And so this returns the actual point, right? Append. Um, and then this is very similar to NumPy. Um, stacking together the initial centroids to create an, a tensor of them. Okay, so the code doesn't look at all weird or different, um, but it's important to remember that when we run this code, nothing happens, okay, other than that it creates a computation graph. So when we call um, uh, k.findInitialCentroids, nothing happens, but because we're in an interactive session, we can now call .eval, um, and that actually runs it. Right? And it runs it, and it 
actually takes the data that's returned from that and copies it off the CPU and put uh, sorry off the GPU and puts it back in the CPU as a NumPy array. So it's important to remember that after you call a eval, we now have an actual genuine regular NumPy array here. And this is the thing that makes us be able to write um, um, code that looks a lot like PyTorch code, because we now know that we can take something that's a NumPy array and turn it into a GPU tensor, like that. And we can take something that's a GPU tensor and turn it into a NumPy array, like that. So, I don't know, I suspect this might, um, this might make uh, TensorFlow developers shake at how horrible this is. It's not, you know, really quite the way you're meant to do things, I think, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's super easy and uh, it seems to work pretty well. Um, this approach where we're calling .eval, you do need to be a bit careful. Um, if this was like inside a loop that we were calling eval and we were copying back a really, really big chunk of data to the GPU and the CPU again and again and again, that would be a performance nightmare. Right? So you, just, you do need to kind of think about what's going on as you do it. So we're, we'll look inside the inner loop in a moment and, and just check. Anyway, um, the result's pretty fantastic. Um, as you can see, this, this little hacky heuristic um, does a great job. And um, you know, it's a hacky heuristic I've been using for decades now, and it's a kind of thing which often doesn't appear in papers. Um, in this case, a similar hacky heuristic did actually appear in a paper in 2007, and an even better one appeared just last year. Um, um, but it's always worth thinking about, like, how can I pre-process my data to kind of create, get it close to where I might want it to be? And often um, these kind of approaches are useful. Um, there's actually, I don't know if we'll have time to maybe talk about it someday, but there's an approach to doing um, PCA, Principal Components Analysis, which has a similar flavor, basically finding random numbers and finding the furthest uh, numbers away from them. Um, so it's a good general technique, actually. All right, so we've got our initial centroids. Um, what do we do next? Well, what we do next is we're going to be doing more computation and TensorFlow with them, so we want to copy them back to the GPU. Okay. And so, because we copied them to the GPU, before we do an eval or anything later on, we're going to have to make sure we go global variable initializes dot run. The question: Can you explain what happens if you don't create interactive session? So, what the TensorFlow authors decided to do in their wisdom was to generate their own whole concept of namespaces and variables and whatever else. So rather than using pythons, um, there's tensorflows. And so a session is basically a, a kind of like a namespace that holds you know, the computation graphs and the variables and so forth. Um, you can uh, and then there's this concept of a, of a context manager, which is basically where you have a with clause in Python and you say well, like with this session, now you're going to do a bunch of stuff in this namespace. And then there's a concept of a graph. You can have multiple computation graphs. So you can say, with this graph, you know, create these various computations. Um, where it comes in very handy is if you want to say, like, run this graph on this GPU, or you know, stick this variable on that GPU. Um, so. Without an interactive session, you basically have to create that session. You have to say which session to use using a with clause, um, and then like there's many layers of that. So within that, you can then um, create name scopes and variable scopes and blah blah blah. So the the annoying thing is the vast majority of tutorial code out there uses all of these concepts, right? It's as if like all of Python's OO and variables and modules doesn't exist, um, and you use TensorFlow for everything. Um, so I wanted to show you that you don't have to use any of these concepts, um, pretty much. Um, like, thank you for the question. Um, yeah. I, I haven't quite finished thinking through this, but have you tried? So you've got your what are there? There's six clusters up there, um, and if you had, if you had, if you had initially said I have seven clusters, 
or eight clusters. What you would find after you hit your six is you'd all of a sudden start getting um, centroids that were very close to previous existing centroids. So it seems like you could somehow intelligently define a, a width of a cluster or, or kind of look for a jump in things dropping down and how far apart they are from some other cluster. Yeah. And programmatically come up with a way to decide the number of yeah. clusters. Yeah, I think you could. Um, you know, maybe then you're using k means. I don't know. Like, yeah, I think it's a fascinating question. Um, I haven't seen that done. Um, there are certainly uh, papers um, about um, figuring out the number of clusters in k means. So maybe during the week you'd check one out, port it to TensorFlow. Um, that'd be that'd be really interesting. And I just wanted to follow up what you said about sessions to um, kind of emphasize that with a lot of tutorials, you could make the code simpler by using an interactive session in a Jupyter notebook instead. Yeah, I remember when Rachel was going through a TensorFlow course a while ago and she kept on banging her head against the desk with sessions and variable scopes and whatever else and we kind of, yeah, that was part of what led us to think, okay, let's, let's simplify all that. All right, so um, step one was to take our initial centroids and copy them onto the GPU. So we now have a symbol representing those. So the next step in the um, k-means algorithm is to take every point and assign them to a cluster, which is basically to say for every point which, which, which of the centroids is the closest. <coughs> so that's what um, assign to nearest does. Um, we'll get to that in a moment, but let's pretend we've done it. This will now be a list of um, which centroid is the closest for every data point. So then we need one more piece of um, um, TensorFlow concepts, which is we want to update an existing um, we want to update an existing variable with some new data. And so we can actually, uh, call update centroids um, to basically do that updating, and I'll show you how to, that works as well. Um, so basically the idea is that we're going to um, loop through doing this again and again and again. Um, but when we just do it once, you can actually see it's nearly perfect already. So um, it's a pretty powerful, uh, pretty powerful idea as long as your initial cluster centers um, are good. So let's see how this works. Assign to nearest. Um, it's a single line of code. And the reason it's a single line of code is we already have the code to find the distance between every piece of data and its centroid. Now rather than calling tf.reducemin, which return the distance to its nearest centroid, we call tf.argmin to get the index of its nearest centroid. So generally speaking, the, the hard bit of doing this kind of highly vectorized code is figuring out this number, which is what axis are we working with, right? And so it's a good idea to actually like write down on a piece of paper, you know, for each of your tensors, it's like it's time by batch, by row, by column, or whatever. Like make sure you know what every um, axis represents. When I'm creating these um, algorithms, I'm constantly printing out the shape of things. And another really simple trick, but a lot of people don't do this, is make sure that your different dimensions actually have different sizes. So when you're playing around with testing things, don't have a batch size of 10 and an n of 10 and a number of dimensions of 10. right? That, I find it much easier to think of real numbers. So like have a batch size of 8 and an n of 10 and a dimensionality of 4, right? Because then every time you print out the shape, you're finding out exactly what everything is. Okay, so this is going to return um, the um, nearest indices. Um, so then we can go ahead and update the centroids. So here is update centroids. And suddenly we have some crazy function. And this is where um, TensorFlow is super handy. Um, it's full of crazy functions. And if you know the computer science term for the thing you're trying to do, 
um, it's generally has it's generally called that, right? And so it's the only other way to find it is just to do lots and lots of searching through the documentation. So in general, um, taking a um, a set of data and sticking it into multiple chunks of data according to some kind of criteria is called partitioning in computer science. Um, so I got a bit lucky when I first looked for this. I googled for TensorFlow partition and bang, this thing popped up. So let's take a look at it. And this is where like reading about GPU programming in general is very helpful, um, because in GPU programming there's this kind of smallish subset of things which everything else is built on, and one of them is partitioning. Okay, so here we have tf.dynamic partition. Um, partitions the data into some number of partitions using some indices. Um, and generally speaking, it's easiest to just look at some code. So here's our data. We're going to create two partitions, we're calling them clusters, and it's going to go um, like this. Um, zeroth partition, zeroth, first, first, zeroth. So 10 will go to the zeroth partition, 20 will go to the zeroth partition, 30 will go to the first partition. Okay, this is exactly what we want. Right? So this is the nice thing, is that there's a lot of these, you can see all this stuff, right? There's so many functions available, often there's the exact function you need. And here it is, right? So we just take our list of indices, convert it to a list of int32s, um, pass it out data, the indices, and the number of clusters, and we're done. Right? This is now um, um, a separate um, array, basically, a separate tensor for each of our clusters. Um, so now that we've done that, um, we can then figure out what is the mean of each of those clusters. So the mean of each of those clusters is our new centroid. Right? So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, which points are the closest to this one? And we're kind of going, okay, these points are the closest to this one. Okay, what's the average of those points? Right? That's all that happened from here to here. Okay, so that's taking the mean of those points. Um, and then we can basically say, okay, that's um, our new partition, that's our new, um, uh, our new clusters. Um, so then just um, join them all together, concatenate them together. Okay, so except for that dynamic partitions, um, well, I mean, in fact, even including that dynamic partitions, that was incredibly simple, but it was incredibly simple because we had a function that did exactly what we wanted. So because we assigned a variable up here, we have to call um, initializer.run. And then of course, before we can do anything with this um, tensor, we have to call .eval to actually call the computation graph and uh, copy it back to our CPU. Okay, so that's all those steps. So then we want to replace the contents of current centroids with the contents of updated centroids. Um, and so to do that, um, we can't just say equals, uh, everything's different in TensorFlow, you have to call dot assign. Right? So this is the same as basically saying current centroids equals updated centroids, but it's creating a computation graph that basically does that um, assignment on the GPU. Sorry, um, how could we extrapolate this to other non-numeric data types, such as words, images? Um, well. Um, they're all numeric data types, really. Um, so an image um, is absolutely a numeric data type. Um, so uh, it's just a bunch of pixels. You just have to decide what distance measure you want, um, which generally just means deciding you're probably using Euclidean distance, but are you doing it in pixel space, or are you picking one of the um, activation layers in a neural net? Um, um, for words, um, you would um, uh, create a word vector your words. Um, 
There's nothing um, specifically two-dimensional about this. this. This works in as many dimensions as we like. And, and that's really the whole point. And I'm hoping that maybe during the week some people will start to play around with some higher dimensional data sets um, to get a feel for um, how this works. Um, particularly if you can get it working on CT scans, that would be fascinating using the uh, five-dimensional clustering we talked about. Okay, so here's what it looks like in total if we weren't using an interactive session. Um, you basically say with tf.session, that creates a session, but as default that sets it to the current session, and then within the with block we can now run things. And then k.run does all the stuff we just saw. So if we go to k.run, here it is. right? So k.run does all of those steps. So this is how you can create a complete computation graph in TensorFlow using a notebook. You do each one one step at a time. Once you've got it working, you put it all together. right? So you can see, find initial centroids, um, dot eval, um, put it back into a variable again, um, assign to nearest, update centroids, um, because we uh, created a variable in the process there, we then have to rerun global variable initializer. Um, we could uh, have avoided this, I guess, by not calling eval and just treating this as a um, variable the whole time, but it doesn't matter. This works fine. Um, and then we just um, loop through a bunch of times calling uh, centroids.assign um, updated centroids. Um, oh, I think I see a bug. Um, what we should be doing after that is then calling update centroids each time. Oh, there you go. Um, I'll fix that during the week. And then the nice thing is because I've used a normal um, um, Python for loop here and I'm calling dot eval. Uh, each time, it means I can check, oh, has, um, have any of the cluster centroids moved? Um, and if they haven't, then I will stop working. Right? So it makes it very easy to kind of create dynamic for loops, which can be quite tricky sometimes with um, TensorFlow otherwise. Um, okay, so that is the uh, uh, the TensorFlow um, algorithm um, from end to end. Uh, Rachel, do you want to pick out uh, an AMA question? So actually, <coughs> um, uh, I kind of am helping start a company. Um, the, um, I don't know if you've seen my talk on TED.com, but I kind of show this demo of this uh, interactive labeling tool. Um, uh, a friend of mine said that he wanted to start a company to actually make that and commercialize it. So I guess my short answer is I'm helping somebody do that because I think that's pretty cool. Um, more generally, um, I've mentioned before I think that the best thing to do is always to scratch an itch. So pick whatever you've been passionate about or something that's just driven you crazy and you know fix it. Um, if you have the benefit of being able to take enough time to do absolutely anything you want, um, I felt like the three most important areas for applying um, deep learning when I last looked, which was two or three years ago, were medicine, uh, robotics, and satellite imagery. Um, because uh, at that time, um, computer vision was the only area that was remotely mature, really, for um, machine learning, uh, deep learning. And those three areas all were um, areas that very heavily used um, computer vision or could heavily use computer vision and uh, were potentially very large markets. Um, medicine is probably the largest industry in the world. Um, I think it's $3 trillion in America alone. Um, robotics isn't currently that large, but at some point it probably will become the largest industry in the world. Um, if you know uh, everything we do manually is replaced with automated approaches. Um, and satellite imagery um, is uh, massively used by military intelligence. We have some of the biggest budgets in the world. So, yeah. So I guess those three areas. Okay. And uh, can I keep going? Oh um, no. Oh, I found no. I found some higher voted questions. Okay, well, next time. Okay.
All right. Um, I'm going to take a break soon. Um, um, before I do, um, I might just uh, introduce what we're going to be looking at next. Um, so um, we're going to start on our um, NLP and specifically translation deep dive. Um, we're going to be really following on from the end-to-end um, um, -end memory networks from last week. Um, the one of the things that I find um, kind of most interesting and most challenging in setting up this course is coming up with good problem sets which are like hard enough to be interesting and um, easy enough to be possible. Uh, and often uh, other people have already done that, so I was lucky enough that somebody else had already shown an example of using sequence to sequence learning for uh, what they called spelling bee. And basically we start with this thing called the CMU Pronouncing Dictionary, which has things that look like this. The wiki, followed by a phonetic description of how to read the wiki. So the way these uh, work, this is actually specifically an American pronunciation dictionary. Um, the uh, uh, consonants are pretty straightforward. Um, the vowel sounds have a number at the end showing how much stress is on each one, right? So either 0, 1, or 2. So in this case you can see that the middle one is where most of the stress is, so it's the wiki. Um, so here is the letter A, and it is pronounced ah. Okay, so the goal uh, that we're going to be looking at after the break is to do the other direction, which is to start with how do you say it, and turn it into how do you spell it. Um, this is quite a difficult question because uh, English is really weird to spell, um, and the number of phonemes um, doesn't uh, necessarily match the <coughs> um, the number of letters. Um, so this is going to be where we're going to start, uh, and then we're going to try and solve this puzzle, and then we'll use a solution from this puzzle to try and learn to translate um, French into English um, using the same basic idea. So let's have a 10 minute break, and we'll come back at um, 7.40. Um, so just to clarify, I just want to make sure everybody understands the, the problem we're solving here. So the problem we're solving is we're going to be told, here is how to pronounce something, okay? And then we have to say, okay, here is how to spell it, right? So this is going to be our input, and this is going to be our target. So this is like a translation problem, but it's a bit simpler. So we don't have um, pre-trained uh, phoneme vectors or pre-trained letter vectors, so we're going to have to do this by building a model, and we're going to have to create some embeddings of our own. So in general, um, the first steps necessary to create an NLP model tends to look very, very similar. Um, I feel like I've done them in a thousand different ways now, and at some point I really need to abstract this all out into a, into a simple set of functions that we use again and again and again. Um, but uh, let's go through it, um, and if you've got any questions about any of the uh, code or steps or anything, let me know. Um, so the basic uh, um, pronunciation dictionary is just a text file, um, and I'm going to just grab the lines which are um, uh, actual words, so they have to start with a letter. Now, something which I have um, uh, actually let's come back to that. Okay, so um, we're going to go through every line in the text file. And here's a handy thing that a lot of people don't realize you can do in Python. Um, when you call open, um, that returns a generator which lists all of the lines. So if you, if you just go for L in open blah. That's now looping through every line in that file, right? So I can then say filter those which start with a um, um, which start with a lowercase letter, right? So uh, sorry, we start with an uppercase letter. They're all uppercase, um, and then uh, strip off any white space um, and um, split it on white space. Uh, so that's the basically the steps necessary to separate out the word from the pronunciation. 
Um, and then the pronunciation uh, is just white space um, delimited, so we can then split that. Um, and that's the steps necessary to get the word and the pronunciation as a set of phonemes. Um, so as we tend to pretty much always do with these language models, we next need to get a list of like what are all of the vocabulary items. So in this case, the vocabulary items are the, all the possible phonemes. So we can create a set um, of uh, every possible phoneme, uh, and then we can sort it. And um, what we always like to do is to get uh, um, an extra um, an extra character or an extra object um, in position zero, because remember we use zero for padding, right? So that's why I stick. I'm going to use underscore as our special padding letter here. So I stick an underscore at the front. So here are the first five phonemes. This is our special padding one, which is going to be index zero, and then there's R, R, and R with three different levels of stress, and so forth. Okay. Now, the next thing that we tend to do anytime we've got a, a list of vocabulary items is to create a list in the opposite direction. So we go from phoneme to index, um, which is just a dictionary where we enumerate through all of our phonemes and put it in the opposite order. So from phoneme to index. I know we've used this. Um, approached a thousand times before, but I just want to make sure everybody understands it. Um, when you use enumerate in Python, it doesn't just return each phoneme, but it returns a tuple that contains the index of the phoneme and then the phoneme itself. So that's the key and the value. So then if we go value comma key, that's now the phoneme followed by the index. And so if we turn that into a dictionary, we now have a dictionary which you can give it a phoneme and return it an index. Um, Here's all the letters of English, again with our special um, underscore at the front. And we've got one extra thing we'll talk about later, which is an asterisk. Um, so that's a list of letters. Um, and so again, to go from letter to letter index, we just create a dictionary um, which reverses it again. Um, okay, so now that we've got our um, um, phoneme to index and letter to index, we can use that to convert this data into numeric data, right? which is like what we always do with these language models. We end up with just a list of indices. Um, we can pick some maximum length word, um, so I'm just going to say 15. Um, and so we're going to create a dictionary um, which maps from um, each word to a list of phonemes, and we're going to get the indexes for them. Yes, Rachel? Um, okay. So this um, dictionary comprehension is a little bit awkward, um, so I thought this would be a good opportunity to talk about dictionary comprehensions and list comprehensions for a moment. Um, so we're going to pause this in a moment, but first of all let's look at a couple of examples um, of list comprehensions. So the first thing to note is when you go something like this, the string x, y, z, or this string here, um, Python is perfectly happy to consider that a list of letters. So the Python considers this the same as being a list of x, y, z. So you can think of this as two lists, a list of x, y, z, and a list of a, b, c. So here is the simplest possible list comprehension. Right? So go through every element of a and put that into a list. So if I call that, then it returns exactly what I started with. Okay, so that's not very interesting. What if now we replaced O with another list comprehension? Okay. So what that's going to do is it's now going to return a list for each list. Okay. So this is one way of pulling things out of sublists, is to basically take the thing that was here and replace it with a new list comprehension, and that's going to give you a list of lists. Now the reason I wanted to talk about this is because it's quite confusing. In Python you can also write this, which is different. So in this case I'm going for each object in our A list, and then for each object in that sublist. And do you see what's different here? I don't have the, like in square brackets, right? It's just all laid out next to each other. So I find this really confusing, but 
the idea is you're meant to think of this as just being like a normal for loop inside a for loop, right? And so what this does is it goes through um, x, y, z, and then a, b, c, and then in x, y, z it goes through each of x and y and z, but because there's no embedded set of square brackets, that actually ends up flattening the list, right? So we just saw... Um, I think... Ah, we're about to see um, an example of the square bracket version, um, and pretty soon we'll be seeing an example of this version as well. These are both useful, right? It's very useful to be able to flatten a list. It's very useful to be able to do things with sublists. And then, just to be aware that any time you have any kind of expression like this, you can replace the thing at the here with any expression you like, right? So we could say, for example, um, it's just upper. <coughs> we could say o dot upper, right? So you can basically map different computations to each element of a list. And then the second thing you can do is put an if here to filter it. Uh, if uh, o zero equals x. Um, what did I read wrong there? Sorry, Rachel. Oh, thank you. Great. Okay, so that's basically the the, the idea. You can create any list comprehension you like by putting computations here, filters here. And optionally, multiple lists of lists here. Um, the other thing you can do is replace the square brackets with curly brackets, in which case you need to put something before a colon and something after a colon. The thing before is your key, and the thing after is your value. So here we're going for. Oh, and then there's another thing you can do, which is if the thing you're looping through um, is a bunch of uh, lists or tuples or anything like that, you can pull them out into two pieces, like so. So this is the word, and this is the list of phonemes. So we're going to have um, the lowercase word will be our keys in our um, dictionary, and the values will be lists. So we're doing it just like we did down here. Um, and the list will be, let's go through each phoneme and go phoneme to index. Okay, so now we have uh, something that maps from every word to its list of phoneme indexes. All right, so that's that. Um, we can find out what the um, maximum length of uh, anything is in terms of how many phonemes there are, and we can do that by, again, we can just go through every one of those dictionary items, calling length on each one, and then doing a max on that. Okay, so there is the maximum length. Right. So you can see like combining list comprehensions with other functions is also powerful. All right, so finally we're going to um, create our nice square arrays. Um, normally we do this with uh, keras.pad sequences. Um, just for a change, we're going to do this manually this time. Um, so the key is that we start out by creating um, two arrays of zeros, um, because all the padding is going to be zero, right? So if we start off with all zeros, then we can just fill in the non-zeros. So this is going to be our um, all of our phonemes, um, this is going to be our actual spelling, that's our target labels. So then we go through all of our, and we've permitted them randomly, so randomly ordered um, things in the pronunciation dictionary, um, and we um, put inside input um, um, all of the uh, items from that pronunciation dictionary, and into labels we go letter to index. All right. So we now have one thing called input, uh, one thing called labels that contains nice rectangular arrays um, padded with zeros um, containing exactly what we want. Okay, I'm not going to worry about this line yet because we're not going to use it. For the starting point. Um, so anyway you see deck something, just ignore that for now, we'll get back to that later. 
Um, train test split is a very handy uh, function from sklearn that takes all of these lists and splits them all in the same way with this proportion in the test set. And so input becomes input train and input test, labels becomes labels train and labels test. So that's pretty handy. We've often written that manually, um, but this is a nice quick way to do it when you've got lots of lists to do. Um, okay, so just to have a look at how many phonemes we have in our vocabulary, there are 70. How many letters in our vocabulary? There's 28. That's because we've got that underscore and the star as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and create the model. Um, so um, here's the basic idea. Um, the model has three parts. Um, the first is um, an embedding, right? So the embedding is going to take um, every one of our phonemes. Okay, max len p is the maximum number of phonemes we have um, in any pronunciation. And each one of those phonemes is going to go into an embedding. Right? And the uh, lookup for that embedding is the uh, vocab size for phonemes, which I think was 70. And then the output you know, is whatever we decide, what dimensionality we want. And in experimentation I found 120 seems to work pretty well. I was surprised by how high that number is, um, but there you go, um, it is. We started out with a list of phonemes, right? a list of phonemes, and then after we go through this embedding, we now have a list of embeddings. So this is like 70, and this is like 120. Okay? So the basic idea is to take this big thing, which is all of our phonemes embedded, and we want to turn it into a single distributed representation which contains all of the richness of what this pronunciation says. And later on we're going to be doing the same thing with an English sentence, right? And so we know that when you have a sequence and you want to turn it into a representation, one great way of doing that is with an R and N. Now, why an R and N? Um, because an R and N we know is good at dealing with things like state and memory, right? So when we're looking at translation, we really want something which can remember, like, where are we, right? So Let's say we were well. Let's say we were doing this simple phonetic translation. The idea of you know, have we just had a C? Because if we've just had a C, then the H is going to make a totally different sound to if we haven't just had a C, right? Um, so an R and N, we think, is a good way to do this kind of thing. And in general, this whole class of models, remember, is called seek to seek sequence-to-sequence sequence models, which is where we start with some arbitrary length sequence and we produce some arbitrary length sequence. And so the general idea here is taking that arbitrary length sequence and turning it into a fixed-sized representation using an R and N is probably a good first step. And you're using dropout in your LSTM. Is it best practice to do dropout across time? So, um, okay, so looking ahead, <laughs> um, I'm actually going to be using quite a few layers of RNN, so to make that easier I've, um, oh, let's do it in drawing mode, um, so to make that easier um, we've created a get RNN function, which just, and so we can, you can put anything you like here, GRU or LSTM or whatever, um, and yes indeed I am using dropout. Um, the kind of dropout that you use in, R in an R and N is slightly different to normal dropout. Um, it turns out that if uh, the particular things you drop out, it's best to have them the same things at every time step um, in an R and N. Um, there's a, a really good paper that explains why this is the case and shows that this is the case. 
So this is why there's a special dropout parameter um, inside the RNN in Keras, is because it does this proper um, RNN style dropout. Um, so yeah, so we'll you know I put in a tiny bit of dropout here, and if it turns out that we um, uh, uh, um, overfit, we can always increase it. Um, if we don't, we could always turn it to zero. Uh, so, so what we're going to do is, um, yes, Rachel. I have one more question about that. Um, can you explain consume less equals GPU? Um, so, yeah, always do that. Um, basically, um, I don't know if you remember, but when we looked at like doing um, RNNs from scratch last year, um, we learned that you could like actually combine the matrices together and like do a single matrix computation. Um, if you do that, it's going to use up more memory, um, but it allows the GPU to be more highly parallel. Um, so basically, um, if you look at the Keras documentation, it'll tell you the different things you can use, but. Um, since we're using a GPU, you probably always want to say consume less equals GPU. Okay, the other thing that we learned about last year is bidirectional RNNs. Um, and maybe the best way to come at this is actually to go all the way back and remind you how RNNs work. Um, we haven't done much revision, but it's been a while since we've looked at RNNs in much detail. So just to remind you, this is kind of our drawing of a totally basic neural net. Um, square is input, circle is um, intermediate activations hidden, and triangle is output, and uh, arrows represent um, affine transformations with nonlinearities. Um, um, we can then have multiple copies of those to create deeper um, convolutions, for example. Um, and so the other thing we can do is actually we can have inputs going in um, at different places. So in this case, if we were trying to predict the third character from first two characters, we can use a totally standard neural network um, and actually have input coming in at two different places. Um, and then we realized that we could kind of make this arbitrarily large, um, but what we should probably do then is make everything where an input is going to a hidden state be the same matrix. So this color coding, remember, represents the same weight matrix. And so hidden to hidden would be the same weight matrix, and hidden to output then is a separate weight matrix. So then, uh, to remind you, we realized that we could draw that more simply like this. Okay. So our it ends, um, when they're unrolled, uh, just look like a normal uh, neural network in which some of the weight matrices are tied together. And uh, if this is not ringing a bell, go back to, I think it's lesson five, where we actually build these weight matrices from scratch and tie them together manually. Um, um, so that'll um, hopefully remind you of what's going on. Now, importantly, we can then take one of those RNNs and have the output go to the input of another RNN. And these are stacked RNNs. And stacked RNNs basically give us you know, richer computations in our recurrent neural nets. Um, and this is what it looks like when we unroll it. So you can see here that we've got multiple inputs coming in, going through multiple layers, and creating multiple outputs. But of course we don't have to create multiple outputs. Um, you could also why isn't that working? Um, <clears throat> you could also get rid of these two uh, triangles here and have just one output. And remember in Keras, the difference is whether or not we say return sequences equals true or return sequences equals false. Um, this one you're seeing here is return sequences equals true. This one here is return sequences equals false. Um, so what we've got is input train uh, has 97,000 words. Um, each one is of length 16. It's uh, 15 characters long plus the um, um, uh, plus the padding. 
and then no, sorry, 16, no, 16 phonemes long, full stop, uh, possibly with padding if necessary. And then labels is 15, um, because we chose earlier on that our max length would be a 15 long spelling. Um, so phonemes don't match to um, letters exactly. Um, so after the embedding, um, so if we take one of those tens of thousands of words, remember it was of length, um, it was of length, uh, for phonemes, length uh, 16, right? Um, and then we're putting it into an embedding matrix, which uh, is um, 70 by 120. And the reason it's 70 is that each of these phonemes contains a number um, between 0 to 69. Right? So basically we go through and we get each one of these indexes and we look up to find it. So this is 5 here, then we find number 5 here. Right? And so we end up with 16 by 120. And then part two of the question says, um, are we then taking a sequence of these phonemes represented as 120 dimensional floating point vectors and using an RNN to create a sequence of word to vec embeddings, which we will then reverse to actual words? Mm. So we're not going to use word to vec here, right? Um, word to vec is a particular set of pre trained embeddings. Um, we're not using pre trained embeddings. We um, have to create our own embeddings. Um, uh, we're creating phoneme embeddings. So if somebody else later on wanted to do something else with phonemes, and we like saved the result of this, we could provide phoneme to vec, and you could download them and use the fast.ai pre-trained phoneme to vec embeddings. Um, so this is how embeddings basically get created, right? There's people build models starting with random embeddings, and then save those embeddings and make them available for other people to use. I may be misinterpreting it, but I thought the uh, question was getting at um, the second set of embeddings uh, when you want to get back to your words. Right. So um, let's wait until we get there, um, because we're going to create letters, not words, and then we'll just join the letters together. Um, so there won't be any word to vec here. So um, we've got as far as creating our embeddings, and then we've, um, we've then got an R and N, which is going to take our um, embeddings and attempt to turn it into a single vector. Um, that's kind of what an RNN does. So um, we've got here um, return sequences by default is true. So this first RNN returns something which is just as long as we started with, right? And so if you want to stack RNNs on top of each other, every one of them is return sequences equals true until the last one isn't. Right? So that's why we have false here. Right? So at the end of this one, it just gives us a single vector, which is the final state. The other important piece is bidirectional. And bidirectional, you can totally do this manually yourself. You take your input um, and feed it into an RNN, and then you reverse your input and feed it into a different RNN, and then just concatenate the two together. So Keras has something which does that for you, which is called bidire bidirectional. And bidirectional actually requires you to pass it an RNN, right? So it takes an RNN and returns two copies of that RNN stacked on top of each other, one of which reverses its input. And so why is that interesting? Well, that's interesting because often in language, what happens later influences what comes before. For example, in French, uh, the gender of your um, le or la, your, def your definite article, depends on the noun that it refers to. So you need to be able to look backwards um, uh, or forwards in both directions to figure out how to match those two together. Or in any language with tense, you know, what, what verb do you use um, depends on the tense uh, and often also depends on the details about the subject and the object. So we want to be able to both look forwards and look backwards, right? So that's why 
we want two copies of the RNN, one which goes from left to right, and one which goes from right to left. And indeed, we could assume that when you spell things, I'm not exactly sure how this would work, but when you spell things depending on what the later stresses might be, or the later um, uh, details of the phonetics might be, might change how you pronounce things um, earlier on. Does the bidirectional RNN concat two RNNs, or does it stack them? Um, it, it, you end up with the same um, you end up with the same number of uh, dimensions that you had before, um, but it basically doubles the number of features that you have. So um, in this case, we have uh, 240, so it just uh, doubles those. Um, and I think we had one question here. Um, so the, the recurrency level was the right word. Recurrency level of RNN or LSTM would be the uh, the input, uh, the length of uh, the maxlen underscore. Right, right, that's the sixteen. Yeah. Okay, and the number seventy here is it like all the possible characters that could? Yeah, all the possible phonemes. We're going from phoneme to oh, character. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. All right, thanks. Okay. Okay. So let's simplify this down a little bit. Um, maybe start again. And basically say we started out with a set of embeddings, and we've gone through two layers, uh, well we've gone through a bidirectional RNN, and then we feed that to a second RNN right, to create a representation of this ordered list of phonemes. Right? And specifically this, this, this is a vector. Okay? So x at this point is a vector, okay? because return sequence is equals false. That vector, once we've trained this thing, the idea is it represents everything that important there is to know about this ordered list of phonemes, everything that we could possibly need to know in order to spell it. Right? So the idea is we could now take that vector and feed it into a new RNN, or even a few layers of RNN, right? And that RNN could basically go through and be with return sequences equals true this time. It could spit out at every time step what it thinks the next letter in this spelling is. Right? And so this is how a sequence to sequence works. Is once one part, which is called the encoder, takes our initial sequence and turns it into a distributed representation into a into a vector using generally speaking some stacked RNNs then the second piece called the decoder takes the output of the encoder and passes that into a separate stack of RNNs with return sequences equals true and those RNNs are taught to then generate the labels in this case the spellings or in our later case, the English sentences. Now, um, in Keras, it's not convenient to create an RNN by handing it some initial state, some initial hidden state. That's not really how Keras likes to do things. Keras expects to be handed a, um, a list of inputs. Um, problem number one. Um, problem number two, if you do hand it to an RNN just at the start, it's quite hard for the RNN to remember the whole time what is this word I'm meant to be translating. Right? It kind of has to keep two things in its head. One is like, what's the word I'm meant to be spelling? And the second is like, what's the letter I'm trying to spell right now? So what we do with Keras is we actually take this whole um, state and we copy it. Um, so in this case we're trying to create a, a word that could be up to uh, 15 letters long. So in other words, 15 time steps. So we take this and we actually make 15 copies of it. 
Okay, and those 15 copies of our final encoder state becomes the input to our decoder RNN. So it seems kind of clunky, right? But it's actually not difficult to do. In Keras, we just go like this. We take the output from our encoder and we repeat it 15 times. Right? So we literally have 15 identical copies of the same vector. And so that's how Keras expects to see things. Um, and it also turns out that it's actually you get better results when you pass into the RNN the state that it needs again and again at every time step. So we're basically passing in saying something saying, we're trying to spell this word, we're trying to spell this word, we're trying to spell this word, we're trying to spell this word. And then as the RNN goes along, it's generating its own internal state, figuring out like what have we spelt so far and what are we going to have to spell next. With a question, why can't we have return sequences equals true for the second bidirectional LSTM? Uh, not bidirectional, for the second LSTM. We only have one bidirectional LSTM. Um, we don't want return sequences equals true here because we're trying to create a representation of the whole word we're trying to spell. So there's no point having something saying here's representation of the first phoneme, of the first two, of the first three, of the first four, of the first five, because we don't really know like exactly which letter of the output is going to correspond to which phoneme of the input. And particularly when we get to translation, it can get much harder. Like Some languages totally reverse the subject and object order or put the verb somewhere else. So that's why we try to pack package up the whole thing into a single piece of state which has all of the information necessary to build our target sequence. So remember, these sequence-to-sequence -sequence models are also used for things like um, image captioning, right? So with image captioning, you wouldn't want to have like something that created a representation separately for every pixel. You know, when you're trying to caption an image, you want a single representation, which is like, this is something that somehow contains all of the information about what this is a picture of. Um, or if you're doing um, uh, neural language translation, um, here's my English sentence, I've turned it into a representation of everything that it means, so that I can gen generate my French sentence. Um, we're going to be seeing later how we can use return sequences equals true um, when we look at um, attention models. But for now, um, we're just going to keep things um, simple. The question is, um, I have an underlying question regarding why don't we just treat text problems the same way we do images? Images have relationships between pixels and shapes that are complex and rely on positional information. Why doesn't that work with word or phoneme embeddings? Well, it does. Um, it absolutely does. Um, and indeed, we can use convolutional models. Um, but if you remember back to lesson five, um, we talked about um, some of the challenges with that. So if you're trying to create something which can um, parse uh, you know, some kind of markup block like this, it has to both remember that it's, oh, you know, you've just opened up a piece of markup, and you're in the middle of it, and then in here you have to remember that you're actually inside a comment block so that at the end you remember to close it. Um, this kind of long-term dependency and memory and stateful representation um, becomes increasingly difficult to do with CNNs um, as they get longer. Um, it's not impossible by any means, um, but RNNs are one good way of, of doing this. Um, but it is critical that we start with an embedding, because where else an image, we're already given, you know, float-valued numbers that really represent the image, that's not true with text. Right? So with text, we have to use embeddings to turn it into these um, nice uh, numeric representations. Uh, RNN is kind of a generic term here, right? So specific uh, network we use is LSTM. Yes. But there is other types we can use? GRU, remember? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. Simple RNN. Uh, so Keras supports like yeah, we, 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 all the ones we did in the last part of the course. So we, we looked at mm -hmm. simple RNN, GRU, and LSTM. Right. 
So is that like is the LSTM would be the best for that task? No. Or no. Uh, uh, not at all. Um, the GIUs and LSTMs are pretty similar, so it's not worth thinking about too much. Uh, okay. Um, all right. So at this point here, we now have um, fifteen copies of of uh, fifteen copies of X. Right, and so we now pass that into two more layers of RNN. So this this here is our encoder, and this here is our decoder. Now there's nothing we did particularly in Keras to say this is an encoder, this is a decoder. The important thing is the return sequence is equals false here, and the repeat vector here. Right. So like, just what does it have to do? Well, somehow it has to take this single summary and create uh, some layers of RNNs until then at the end we say okay here's a dense layer right and it's time distributed so remember that means that we actually have 15 dense layers um, and so each of these dense layers now has a softmax activation um, which means that we uh, basically can then do an argmax on that to create our final um, list of letters. So this is kind of our reverse embedding, if you like. So the model is very little code, right? And once we've built it, um, and again, if, if, if things like this are mysterious to you, go back and re-look at lessons four, five, and six. Um, remind you how these uh, embeddings work and how these kind of like time distributed dense works um, to give us effectively a, a kind of reverse embedding. So that's our model. Um, starts with our phoneme input, um, ends with our time distributed dense output. Um, we can then compile that. Um, our targets are just indexes. Remember we turn them into indexes, so we use this handy sparse categorical cross-entropy. Um, it's just the same as our normal categorical cross-entropy, but rather than one-hot encoding, we just skip the whole one-hot encoding and just leave it as an index. And we can go ahead and fit, passing in our training data, so that was our um, rectangular data of the phoneme indexes. Um, our labels, um, and then we can use some valid uh, our test set data that we set aside as well. So we fit that for a while. Um, I found that the first three epochs, the loss went down like this. The second three epochs, it went down like this. It seemed to be flattening out, so that's where as far as I stopped it. So um, we can now see how well that worked. Um, now what I wanted to do was not just say what percentage of letters are correct, because um, that doesn't really give you the right sense at all. Right? Um, what I really wanted to know is um, what percentage of words are correct. Um, so that's all this little eval keras um, function does. Um, it takes the thing that I'm trying to evaluate, um, calls dot predict on it. Um, it then does the argmax uh, as per usual to take that softmax and turn it into a specific number, which which character is this? And then I want to check whether it's true for all of the characters that the real character equals the predicted character. Okay, so this is going to return true only if every single item in the in the word is correct. Uh, and so then taking the mean of that. It's going to tell us what percentage of the words did it get totally right. And unfortunately the answer is not very many. 26%. So let's look at some examples. So we can go through 20 words at random, um, and we can print out um, all of the phonemes with dashes between. So here's an example of some phonemes. Um, we can print out the actual word, um, and we can print out our prediction. So here is a whole bunch of words that I don't really rec rec recognize. Uh, perturbations. It should be spelled like that. Oh, we spelled it like 
that slightly wrong. Um, so you can see some of the time the mistakes it makes are pretty clear. So Laro could be spelt like that, but this seems perfectly reasonable. Um, sometimes, on the other hand, it's way off. Um, and interestingly, um, what I what you find is that most of the time, when it's way off, um, I found it tends to be with the um, longer words. Um, and the reason for that is that the longer the word, so like this one where it's terrible, is by far the most phonemes, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven phonemes. So it, we had to somehow create a single representation that contained all of the information of all of those eleven phonemes in a single vector. And that's hard to do, right? And then that single vector got passed, I mean copied, but passed to the decoder, and that was <coughs> everything it had to try to create this uh, output. Okay. So um, that's the problem with this basic encoder-decoder method. And indeed, here is a graph from, uh, from the model Pardon me. From the paper which originally um, which originally introduced uh, attentional models, and this is for neural translation. What it showed is that as the um, as the sentence length got bigger, the standard approach which we're talking about, the standard encoder or decoder approach, the uh, accuracy absolutely died. So um, what these researchers did was that they built a new kind of um, RNN model called an attentional model. And with the attentional model, the accuracy actually stayed pretty good. So goal number one for the next couple of lessons is for me not to have a cold anymore. Um, um, yeah, so basically um, we're going to finish our deep dive into neural translation, and then we're going to look at time series, although we're not specifically looking at time series. It turns out that the best way um, that I've found for time series is not specific to time series at all, um, but uh, you'll see what I mean. Um, reinforcement learning was something I was planning to cover, um, but <clears throat> I just haven't found almost any uh, good examples of it actually being used in practice to solve important real problems. Um, and indeed, um, when you look at the... Um, have you guys seen the paper in the last week or two about using evolutionary strategies for reinforcement learning? Basically, it turns out that using basically random search uh, is better than reinforcement learning. Um, um, that this paper, by the way, is like ridiculously overhyped. Um, these evolutionary strategies is uh, something that I was working on over 20 years ago, and uh, in those days, um, these uh, genetic algorithms, as we called them, used much more sophisticated methods than DeepMind's brand new evolutionary strategies. Um, so people are like rediscovering these randomized meta heuristics, um, which is great, but they're still far behind where they were 20 years ago. Um, but far ahead of um, reinforcement learning approaches. So given I try to teach things which I think are actually going to stand the test of time, um, I'm not at all convinced that any current technique for reinforcement learning is going to stand the test of time, so I don't think we're going to touch that. Um, part three, yeah, um, I think before that we might have a part zero um, where where we do practical machine learning for coders, talk about decision tree ensembles and training test splits and stuff like that. Um, um, yeah, and then yeah, we'll see where we are. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I'm sure Rachel and I are not going to stop doing this in a hurry. It's really fun and interesting, and, um, and we're really interested in your ideas about how to, how to keep this going. Like by the end of part two, you know, you guys have put in hundreds of hours, you know, maybe, you know, on average maybe 140 hours. Um, put together your own box, 
written blog posts, done hackathons, you know, you're seriously in this now. Um, and in fact, uh, I've got to say, this week's kind of been special for me. Like, this week's been the week where again and again I've spoken to various folks of you guys and heard about how, like, how many of you have, like, implemented projects at your workplace that have worked and are now running and making your business money, or that you've, you know, achieved the career thing that you've been aiming for, or that you've, you know, won yet another GPU at a hackathon. Like, you know, or of course the, the social impact thing where it's like all these transformative and inspirational things that, are, you know, it's it's gone from, you know, when Rachel and I started this, we had no idea if it was possible to teach people, you know, with no specific required math background other than high school math, you know, deep learning to the point that you could use it to build cool things. Um, we thought we probably could because I don't have that background and I've been able to. Um, but you know, I've been kind of playing around with similar things for a couple of decades. Um, so it was a bit of an experiment and yeah, this this week's been the week that for me it's been clear that the experiments worked. So um, I don't know what part three is going to look like. It's I think it'll be a bit different because it's like it'll be more of a meeting of minds among, amongst a group of people who are kind of at the same level and thinking about the same kinds of things. Um, and so maybe it's more of a yeah, more of a um, ongoing um, keep our knowledge up to date kind of thing. It might be more of us teaching each other. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I'd certainly be interested to hear uh, ideas. Okay. Um, we don't normally have two breaks, but I think I need one today, and we're covering a lot of territory. So why don't we have um, a, a short break and, um, well, oh, hang on, it's 8.34. Uh, yeah, let's have a short break and we're before the last 20 minutes. Let's come back at um, 8.40. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so, attention, models, attention models. So um, I actually, I really like these. I think they're great. Um, and um, really the paper that introduced these it was quite extraordinary uh, paper introduced um, both GIUs and attention models at the same time. I think it might even be before the guy had his PhD, if I remember correctly. Um, it was just a wonderful paper, um, very successful. Um, and the basic idea of an attention model um, is it's actually pretty simple. Um, you'll see here. Uh, let's see, where does this happen? Great. Okay. Here is here's our decoder, right? Okay. And here's our embedding. Okay. And notice here, remember that um, for my get RNN return sequences uh, equals true is the default. So the decoder now is actually spitting out a sequence of states. Now the length of that sequence is equal to the number of phonemes, right? And we know that there isn't a mapping one-to-one -one of phonemes to letters, right? So this is kind of interesting to even think about how we're going to deal with this, right? How are we going to deal with um, 16 states? And the states, because they started with bidirectional, state 1 both represents a combination of everything that's come before the first phoneme and everything that's come after, and state 2 is everything that's come before the second phoneme and everything that's come after, and so forth. Right? So the states, in a sense, are all representing something very similar, but they've got a different focus. You know, each one of these states, and each one, of, and remember the length is 16, right? So each one of these 16 states um, represents uh, everything that comes before and everything that comes after that point, but with a focus on on that phoneme. Okay, so what we want to do now is create a an RNN, 
where um, the number of inputs to the RNN needs to be 15, not 16, because remember the length of the word we're creating is 15, right? So we're going to have 15 output time steps. And at each point, we wanted to have the opportunity to look at all of the 16 output states, but we're going to go in with the assumption that only some of those 16 are going to be relevant. Um, but we don't know which. right? So what we want to do is basically create a um, so that take a basically take each of these um, 16 states, and do a weighted sum, right? Sum of weights times um, um, encoded states, right? Where these weights somehow represent how important is each one of those 16 inputs for calculating this output, and how important are each of those 16 inputs for calculating this output, and so forth. Right? If we could somehow come up with a set of weights for every single one of those time steps, then we can replace the length 16 thing with a single thing. Right? And if it turns out that um, output number 1 only really depends on input number 1 and nothing else, then basically that input, those weights are going to be 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Right? Like it can it can learn to do that, but if it turns out that um, if it turns out that um, output number one actually depends on phonemes one and two equally, then it can learn the weights 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So in other words, we want some function wi equals some function that returns the right set of weights to tell us which bit of the decoded input to look at. So it so happens we actually know a good way of learning functions. What if we made the function a neural net? And what if we learned it using SGD? Why not? So here's the paper. Neural Machine Translation by Jointly alert, Learning to Align and Translate. And it's a great paper. Um, it's not the clearest, in my opinion, in terms of understandability, um, but let me describe some of the main pieces. Okay, so here's the starting point. Oopsie daisy, that's not how to do it. Um, okay, let's describe how to look at, read this equation. When you see a probability like this, um, you can very often think of it as a loss function. Right? The idea of, um, of SGD, basically, most of the time when we're using it, is to come up with a model where the probabilities that the model creates are as high as possible for the true data and as low as possible for the other data. That's like a, just another way of talking about a loss function. right? So very often when you read the papers where we would write a loss function, a paper will say a probability. And what this here says, uh, earlier on they say that y is basically our, um, our outputs. Very common for y to be an output. And what this is saying is that the probability of the output at time step i Right, so at some particular time step, depends on, so this bar here means depends on, um, all of the previous outputs. Right? So in other words, um, in our spelling um, thing, uh, when we're looking at the fourth letter that we're spelling, it depends on the three letters that we spelt so far. Um, you can't have it depend on the later letters, that's cheating. Right? So this is basically a description of the problem is that we're building something which is time-dependent and where the i-th thing that we're creating 
can only be allowed to depend on the previous i minus 1 things, comma, that basically means and, and it's also allowed to depend on, okay, anything in bold is a vector, right? A vector of inputs. And so this here is our list of phonemes, right? And this here is our list of all of the letters we've spelt so far. Okay, so, um, so that whole thing, right, that whole probability, uh, we're going to calculate using some, some function. Right? And because this is a neural net paper, you can be pretty sure it's going to turn out to be a neural net. Um, and what are the things that we're allowed to calculate with? Well, we're allowed to calculate with the previous letter that we just translated. What's this? The R and N hidden state that we've built up so far, and what's this? A context vector. What is a context vector? The context vector is a weighted sum of annotations h. So these are the hidden states that come out of our encoder, and these are some weights. Right? So I'm trying to give you enough information to try and parse this paper over the week. Right, so that's everything I've described so far. The weights, and now the nice thing is that hopefully you guys have now read enough papers that you can look at something like this and skip over it and go, oh, that's just softmax. Like over time, your pattern recognition starts getting good, right? Like you start seeing something like this, and you go, oh, that's a weighted sum. And you see something like this, and you go, oh, that's softmax. Like, people who read papers don't actually read every symbol. Their eye looks at it and goes, oh, softmax, weighted sum, logistic function, okay, got it, right? Um, as if it was like pieces of code, only this is like really annoying code that you can't look up in a dictionary, and you can't run, and you can't check it, and you can't debug it. But apart from that, it's just like code. Okay, so all right, so the alphas are things that came out of a softmax. All right, what goes into the softmax? All right, something called E. The other annoying thing about math notation is often you introduce something and define it later. All right, so here we are, later we define E. What's E equal to? E is equal to some function of what? Some function of the previous hidden state and the encoder state. Okay, and what's that function? Well, that function is, again, a neural network. Now the important piece here is jointly trained. Jointly trained means it's not like a, a GAN, where we train a bit of discriminator and a bit of generator. It's not like um, one of these kind of manual attentional models where we first of all figure out the nodules are here and then we zoom into them and find them there. Jointly trained means we create a single model in a single computation graph, if you like, where the gradients are going to flow through everything. So we have to try and come up with a way, basically, where we're going to build a standard regular RNN, right? But the RNN is going to use as the input at each time step this, right? So we're going to have to come up with a way of actually of actually making this mini neural net. This is just a single one hidden layer standard neural net. It's going to be inside every time step in our RNN. So um, this whole thing. Um, is summarized in another paper. Um, this is actually a really cool paper, um, Grammar as a Foreign Language. Um, lots of names you probably recognize here, Jeffrey Hinton, who's kind of father of deep learning, um, Elia, who's now I think like chief scientist or something at, um, huh? Director. Director of Science uh, at uh, OpenAI, um, 
Oreo Vignoles has done lots of cool stuff. Um, this paper is kind of neat uh, and fun anyway. It basically says, um, uh, what if you didn't know anything about grammar and you attempted to build a neural net which assigned grammar to sentences? Um, and it turns out you actually end up with something more accurate than any um, rule-based grammar system that's been built. Um, one of the nice things they do um, is to summarize all the bits. And again, this is where like, if you were reading a paper the first time and didn't know what an LSTM was and went, oh, an LSTM is all these things, that's not going to mean anything to you, right? You have to recognize that people write stuff in papers I mean, there's no point writing LSTM equations in papers, right? But it's basically, you're going to have to go and find the LSTM paper or find a tutorial, like learn about LSTMs. When you're finished, come back. In the same way, they summarize attention. Okay? So they say we've used or adapted the attention model from 2. If you go and you have a look at 2, okay, that's the paper we just looked at. All right. Um, but the nice thing is that because this came a little later, they've done a pretty good job of trying to summarize it into a single page. So um, during the week, if you want to try and get the hang of attention, you might find it good to have a look at this paper and look at their summary. Um, and you'll see that basically the idea is um, that um, it's a standard sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. So a standard sequence-to-sequence -sequence model means encoder, hidden states, the final hidden state, decoder. right? Um, plus adding attention, okay? Um, and so we have two separate LSTMs, an encoder and a decoder. And now be careful of the um, notation. Encoder states are going to be called H. The decoder states are H1 through HTA. The decoder states are D, um, which we're also going to call H. TA plus 1 to TA plus TB. Um, so the inputs are 1 through TA, and here you can see is defining a single layer neural net. Okay, So we've got um, our um, uh, decoder states, um, we've got our current encoder state, um, put it through a nonlinearity, put it through another affine transformation, um, stick it through a softmax, and use that to create a weighted sum. Okay, so there's like all of it in one little snapshot. Okay, so uh, again, like don't expect this to make perfect sense the first time you see it necessarily, but hopefully you can kind of see that, you know, these bits are all stuff you've seen lots of times before. So next week we're going to come back and work through, you know, cre creating this code um, and seeing uh, seeing how it works. Did you have something, Rachel? Uh, we have two questions. Uh, one is, won't the weights be, the weightings be heavily impacted by the padding done to the input set? Sure, absolutely. Um, and specifically, those weights will say, oh, the padding is always weighted zero. It's not going to take it very long to learn to create that pattern. And is A shared among all IJ pairs, or do we train a separate alignment for each pair? No, A is not trained. A is the output of a oops. A is the output of a softmax. What's trained is W1 and W2. And note that capital letters are matrices, right? So we just have to learn a single W1 and a single W2. But note that they're being applied to. Um, all of the input, sorry, all of the encoded states and the current state of the decoder, right? And you know, in fact, easier is to just abstract out this all the way back to say it is some function, right? Like this is the best way to think of it. It's some function of what? Some function of the current hidden state and all of the decoder states. Right? So that's that's the inputs to the function, and we just have to learn a set of weights that will spit out the inputs to our softmax. Does 
Did you say you had another question? Okay, great. So I don't feel like I want to introduce something new, so let's take one final AMA before we go home. Advice on imbalanced data sets. Oh, okay. Um, unbalanced data sets, yeah. Um, there's not really that much clever you can do about it. You know, basically, um, if you've got um, well, a great example would be um, um, one of the impact talks talked about uh, breast cancer detection from um, mammography scans, and uh, this thing called the Dream Challenge um, had uh, what What was it? Like uh, less than one percent, three percent, zero point three percent of the scans um, actually had cancer. Um, so that's very unbalanced. Um, I think. The first thing you try to do with such an unbalanced data set is ignore it and try it, try it and see how it goes. Um, the reason that often it doesn't go well is that the initial gradients will tend to point to say they never have cancer, you know, because that's going to give you a very accurate model. So one thing you could try and do is to come up with some kind of initial model, which is like you know, maybe some kind of heuristic, which is not terrible, and gets it to the point where the gradients are, you know, don't always point to saying they, they never have cancer. Um, but the really obvious thing to do is to um, adjust your thing, which is creating the mini batches, so that on every mini batch um, you grab like half of it as being people with cancer and half of the people being without cancer. Um, so um, that way. You know, you can still go through lots and lots of epochs. Um, it's a bit of a ch the challenge is that you're going to the people that do have cancer, you're going to see lots and lots and lots of times. So you have to be very careful of overfitting. Um, um, and then basically, there's kind of things between those two extremes. So I think what you really need to do is figure out what's the smallest number of people with cancer that you can get away with. You know, what's the smallest number where the gradients don't point to zero? Um, and then create a model where, so let's say it's 10%. So create a model where every batch, mini batch, you create 10% of it with people with cancer and 90% people without. Um, train that for a while. Um, the good news is, once that's working pretty well, um, you can then decrease the size that has the has cancer size because you're already at a point where your model's not kind of pointing off to zero, right? So you can kind of gradually start to change the sample to have less and less. Um, yeah, I think that's the basic technique. Um, so in this example where you're you're repeating the the positive results um, over and over again, you're you're essentially just waiting more. Yeah. Could you get the same results by just throwing away a bunch of the false data set? Yeah, no, I, I, you could do that, and like that's the really quick way to do it. But that way, you're not using all, like the information about the false stuff still has information. So yeah, okay. Thanks everybody. Have a good week.